Well, all right, guys, here we are on the Muzzle Blast Podcast, episode two. I am in Las Vegas right now. We're at SHOT Show 2019. So I've had the absolute privilege of sitting down with the guys with Uinta Precision. We're sitting here with Jason, Jason, and Richard. So it's going to be a great conversation. We tackle all things about the new Uinta Precision rifles, UPR-15, UPR-10, right hand, left hand, all the cartridges available, and the performance that these guys have personally experienced with all the different cartridges and chamberings they've tested with. We talk about the show as well. Uh, it was late week here at SHOT Show. We're all starting to run a little bit low on energy, but it's been a great conversation. You learn a lot about how the rifles were put together, where the concepts came from, and really what it took to get this business off the ground. So without further ado, here's you went to Precision on the second episode of the Muzzle Blast podcast. Well, all right, guys, here we are. We're in the hotel room down here at SHOT Show in Las Vegas. Uh, it's later in the week. We've had a long week. We're all pretty tired, but I'm sitting here with the you went to Precision guys. We've got the whole group here and everyone from their booth that's been down here helping us out. So why don't you start it off, Richard? Uh, how did how did we get to this point here at Las Vegas? How long have you been planning this one? Planning the actual trip or working it? At what we are now. Just plan on the trip to specifically be a shot. Trip. Oh, dude, that's a full time job. <laughs> Seriously, I've been working at the, the shot show booth since June. Okay, awesome. That Almost seems... non stop. And so, for you guys are a first time exhibitor, uh, you guys have been able to pull off some pretty incredible stuff ending up at Range Day and getting a pretty decent booth in the show as well. Yeah. Yeah, yes. not having to start in the hallway, actually starting in a booth. Yeah, so it worked out pretty slick. The I went to what they have this uh, shot shot show does a shot train in like June every year, and so right. I went down to that and I started asking around. And actually, I guess it started before that when I applied for the booth because I knew I had a booth, an actual booth, and not a kiosk before the training um, but uh, at at the training I asked every every everything with a heartbeat that had a shot show shirt on about range day you know trying to get information on it and I finally talked to a lady I can't remember her name but she was over the the shot show training and she's oh yeah I, I know this girl that you know can help you out and at least we can check and see if there is a booth, because everybody before that just said, no. <laughs> you know, not, I mean, no questions. No, there's no, there's no booze at Ranch Day. And <clears throat> I didn't accept that. So I got the lady that was over, oh, and I don't know who she is either. If I knew who they were, I'd, you know, thank them. <laughs> Give her a shout out, yeah. But uh, she, I called her up on the phone, talked to her. She says, oh yeah, there's an opening. Uh, there's a there's a booth open and at first it was just uh, a short range booth so like a hundred yards or something like that but I didn't want one of those yeah. and so I pestered and pestered and pestered and finally was able to to lock down a 200 to 500 yard booth at range day that was an awesome booth so before we get carried away too far here let's introduce the other guys as well so starting on my left here who are you and how did you get roped into this uh, I'm Jason Baker. I don't know, how did I get roped out of this? I got invited. Who's going to turn down a day at Range Day and SHOT Show? Yeah. But uh, I've got a retail store <clears throat> in the same town okay. as you and I, and we're friends, and we do a lot of stuff together. And he's been he's been huge for me, because I'm not, not up on all of the who's who's and how's how's in the gun industry, how things work, you know, the people to know the you know the and not just that kind of thing but where he's got a, a retail store he knows you know what things should retail for how much dealers are expected in the way of markup and margins and things like that so Jason's been a huge help to me that way and also in marketing you know who to market what I've what we've got to yeah, so absolutely. he's been huge huge help that way big supplier too Oh yeah, I buy all my gun parts he, he from did, him. He's a big supplier for us too. 
Yeah, so people who don't know, uh, you went to Precision is out of a smaller town in Utah where there's not just superstores hanging out on every corner. So having a gun store that's actually available to you guys is a huge help. A huge, it's been a huge help to us for sure. And then over here on our right, we have another Uinta Precision guy. And uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell us what you do for Uinta. Uh, my name's Jason Woods, and I do what I'm told. I <laughs> wish. I, I wish. I, no, I do what I'm told. <laughs> he does what he's told when he wants to. Well, he does what he's he told, to. but he informs you how he feels about it. Well, he's always, okay, that, he's always that's open about <laughs> how he feels about it. <clears throat> I... I build. I, I build. I physically touch every single gun that runs through our shop. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. I've talked to you along this trip, and you said that you fired every single you in the Every precision, single right? precision. I, I, precision I fire, fire, the shop. I fire yeah, every, every, every upper. Yeah. And so what's cool about that is I recently got my upper in 6.5 Grendel, and I looked on the box and it said, Assembled by Jason, and it had WDS on there, yeah. and then it turns out it really is from Jason, so I was able it to get really it. Jason, yes. I headspace every I headspace every rifle. I assemble every rifle. I inspect every rifle, and I fire every rifle. Awesome. So one of the things that brings us to Shot Show 2019, um, what what are some of the new products that are available from you into Precision this year that you guys are really trying to get out there? Well, for starters, I feel like all of our products are really new because we've only been in business not quite two years. Absolutely. So pretty much our full line which is not real extensive is new but to the biggest thing we're pushing are our left-handed receivers uh, left-handed receiver assemblies and uh, the UPR 10 with the second generation bolts so yeah so new bolts yes yeah, new bolts new bolts, new bolts. Ooh, game yeah, changers nice game changers yeah so just to be clear here uh, you went to Precision has a bolt action AR upper and they have them available for the AR 15 and the AR 10 um, which one of those two came out first? Ten, AR ten, and I think with, I think if I hadn't have done the ten first, I wouldn't have finished the fifteen. <laughs> the fifteen was so much harder than the ten. Is there a reason why the fifteen is harder? So yeah, the center line. This I don't know. Anybody's gonna understand. <laughs> the the technical where to where to begin on <laughs> oh what's wrong right oh, <laughs> before yeah, you go. <laughs> So the center line of the rifle, so the upper center line of the upper receiver, we'll say, is lower than on the 10. So even though those things take the same parts, you know, the same buffer tubes, the same pistol grips, all that stuff, the center line of the buffer tube versus where um, the hammer, the hammer and everything, the top of your lower receiver. The center line is higher on the UPR 10s or on AR 10s in general than it is on AR 15s. It's like a sixteenth of an inch, or actually, it's a little more than that. It's like seventy something thou higher on the 10s than it is on the 15s. That's pretty wild. So you also mentioned that you guys have new bolts. So what have you done on your new bolts versus the old ones? What kind of improvements have you guys made on those? They're everything. Everything the improved. The injectors, no. the, they feed better, they run better. They just so, so I'll tell you some of the problems we have had, and it wasn't a, they weren't super common problems, and they weren't like debilitating problems for the UPR tens. Um, some of the very first ejector springs we used weren't very good, and so after a while they they get weak, and then it doesn't it doesn't eject your brass like it's supposed to. Um, one of the other problems was that our extractors weren't, I mean they just weren't high quality, they were, I bought Savage, <laughs> Savage extractors for the first ones, and so they, they uh, sometimes they'd let go of your brass. Um, another problem was the way I, I had the first bolts designed, uh, the bearing surface in the back, on the back of the bolt wasn't, it was, uh, I don't remember what the percentages were, but anyway, it wasn't wasn't a very good percentage, so your bolt would actually sag in the rear um, until you had a round chambered, and so it it didn't it didn't feed real well sometimes, and it didn't you know it didn't run super smooth, and it did kind of drag a little bit on. I never was happy 
with that first bolt, but I didn't I didn't know what else to do at that point. So on the new ones, we actually came up with a new design while developing the UPR 15 bolts. Mm -hmm. um, so there's much much more bearing surface on the bolts. They they run so much smoother. Uh, they feed perfect now. Um, the, and we put in a much bigger ejector and a much better extractor. So, um, I mean, I don't know if you noticed it range day, but the, I mean, it when you pull it back, I mean, it chucks that brass. It and, and touching on range day real quick, while we were out there, we would give each person six rounds. We fired at least 700 rounds through the 6.5 Creedmoor itself. Uh, we never cleaned the gun or anything, and I never saw one failure to feed at all. There was no, never a failure to feed, never a failure to eject, never a, I'd say if the wind wasn't blowing 30 miles an hour, I don't think anybody would have missed all day. The only, the, the Magpul mags were starting to fail before the rifle was failing. And that's because all the dirt blowing around. Yeah. So at range day, dirt. yeah, at range day this year, we go out to set up the booth the day before, beautiful, sunny, we're hanging out there, there's no wind, Good couldn't times. have asked for a better day to shoot some long range. Good range day. We get out there the next day, it's frigid cold, there's a 40 mile an hour wind that is chilled to the bone cold, and we're stuck out there for eight hours, and uh, you got a 30 mile an hour crosswind going along. We brought a 224 Valkyrie and a 65 Creedmoor, so we have the UPR 15 and the UPR 10. And uh, I'm sure we were one of the few companies out there taking people and pushing them out to 500 yards and telling them that they could do it. We had the wind figured out for the most part uh, through the whole day, shooting over 700 rounds through those barrels. Um, we never had to adjust our elevation either. No. And we had some people shoot it. 200 and 400 and then out to 500 and all three of those dopes remained constant through the whole trip. The whole trip yeah. yeah, I was a little nervous we were going to end up chasing it around a little bit because of the wind and the temperature changes all, all day long. You know, but the, the like you said, the elevation ch never changed. Our wind changed. Hell, it changed from side to side. Yeah. In the morning we were holding left and then the evening, or no, right, and then by the time it was over we were holding left because of the wind. So, I mean, it yeah, those guns, they, they're they well broke in at this point, those two. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we never oiled the actions, we never. No, we, we didn't have time. Right? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, they come straight out of the box, went right to the rain. <clears throat> went to work. Yeah, absolutely. So, why don't we go back to when you first came up with the idea for the UPR-10 and what it took from the first concept to what you put yourself through to having a firing rifle. That's, that's Man, pretty interesting. First, first concept. I wouldn't know where to begin with the first concept. We talked about it. I heard him and another, you know, Jason and another one of our employees at the time talk about it. Uh, I think it was Wilby. <laughs> it's been a long talk time. Talk about it years before. And I thought about it. And I like bolt guns. I never even. I've never even owned an AR until I decided to do this. That's <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. <laughs> I still have the AR-10 up. I think I've told you this. I have my original DPMS Oracle AR-10 upper. Still never fired a shot out of it. <laughs> I fired it. He's fired oh, okay. it. <laughs> I've never fired a shot You can't have a gun and not shoot it. It's just not right. I, I it's un-American to have a gun and not shoot it. <laughs> Old guy needs to understand that. He's a, he's a collector. <laughs> He's a collector. <laughs> He's a collector. But yeah, I mean, we, you know, the little background, we we were, we still have another company that we, we do, we build mining equipment, we, we work on power plants and stuff like that, but yeah. business fell off big time for, for a long, you know, for... For the Obama administration? Oh, yeah, yeah we'll just come out and say, I mean, that... That Obama administration cut a lot of throats. It did. I, you know, I had the people that I'd worked with and grew up working with had to lay off. You know, I, I had to lay off 60% of my guys during that eight years. And I, I was, I went to a coal mine, and you know, I'd been racking my brain trying to figure out things we could do to replace the work we were losing. 
and I really like building guns. I, you know, I built, been, I always tinkered with building bolt action, custom bolt actions for people on the side, on just Remingtons and Remington clones and stuff like that. So I, I wanted to originally build Remington clones, but. I couldn't, for the life of me, figure out a way to change a Remington clone enough to to set us apart to even break into the market at all. Yeah. And you know the Ruger Precision had just come out, and everybody was loving it. And I, and I liked the Ruger Precision, and it was actually my inspiration. You know, I thought if Ruger can get a bolt gun, a bolt gun to feed out of an AR mag. Why can't I? And so I called Jason on the phone on the way home from a coal mine and asked him, you know, are you, you sure that no one has built a bolt action AR? Not a, not a real one, you know, I knew. We had talked about the push poles and the eliminated gas systems and stuff like that, but that's just not, not a bolt gun. I mean, it's... Doesn't have the same feel. No, and it, it's not, it just doesn't. So I asked him to look, he never looked, I didn't find this out until just the other day, but... I didn't, I didn't know he was serious. We talked about it several times. Yeah. Over the, I don't know, of course, 10 years or something like that. We talked a few times randomly about it, and it's always been kind of fleeting, and it never, it, it was just conversation. When yeah. he told me to look, I just blew it off. That ain't gonna happen, you know? It, no, no shit. A week later, we was... Getting in the process. When he told me no one else, you know, that no one built one, I spent a lot of nights wide awake staring at the ceiling thinking about how to do it, how to get it to feed, pick the ammo up, how to get the bolt to be able to, to rotate over the top of the magazine yet still be in the magazine to pick the rounds up when it needed to, and how to make it so that, you know, it was safe enough to operate without, you know, a really great risk of blowing your head off with this swing and hammer underneath this bolt action. And at that time, I didn't know, I didn't have, I had SolidWorks program on my computer, but I didn't really know how to, to run it. I'd ran it enough to, to draw basic shapes and, you know, bushings and pins and stuff like that for our mining equipment. Yeah. But I didn't know... I don't crap about. It. I still you, don't. That's you a, know how to really engineer off of. No, it. that is a seriously big program. I still don't know how to run it like it could be ran. But so after that, uh, I signed myself up for a for a SolidWorks Essentials course at uh, Go Engineer in Salt Lake. It's a week long course, and it's like drinking out of a fire hose, man. <laughs> Those guys they cover a lot of material in a week. But it was just enough to help me get to where, you know, I understood the program enough that I started to, to draw it and design it. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't take too long to get the first few drafts drawn. Uh, bear in mind, all, all of this were all the schooling, all of the work, the drafts, the 3D printing, and even some of the parts was on his own time for no pay and the expenses was out of his pocket. I know that you have a family at home and you're also running a full-time job at UNT Machine. Yeah. Correct. So he's, he's pretty dedicated to getting this bolt action AR out there. Yeah, I mean, I like bolt guns, man. <laughs> I do. And when I, when I thought that we could actually do it, I got really excited about it, you know. I, one of those things where it just kind of consumed me for a while. Still um, does. It still does. But yeah, I got really excited about it and went right to work on it. And when I had my first prototype 3D printed up and everything, I started showing, you know, showing my partners, my you know, my dad and uh, my uncle and, and and everybody who's in you and a machine and you and a precision with us. Uh, you know, everybody's like, yeah, you know, I, th I think we could make it work, and I think that there would be a market for it. And we came down to the shop show the first year and looked around to make sure that there wasn't one. So you guys were showing up as guests. As that. guests, yeah. We were. We came down as as guests the very first time, and and it was just strictly a scouting mission. 
you know, I walked the entire stinking thing looking for a bolt action up receiver and there was nothing, you know, the push poles and the limited gas systems and stuff, but there was no real answer to that precision bolt action for an AR. Yeah, so you say you had one 3D printed. Um, after that point, it's time to start working with metal. Were there multiple generations and designs that you went through actually machining bolts and uppers <laughs> that you went through? No, dude. Man, I don't. I, I can't even tell you how many different versions of the bolts there are. Um, here's here's a great question. Did it always? Because currently it's a three lug bolt. Was that always the plan to go three lug, or did you guys try two? I tried more? two. And I tried, I, tr I tried two and three, and two, and it was because of the the extractors were hard to. There's so many issues, man. Like <laughs> things you would never think of, <laughs> and little things just totally wipe out what you've done, you know, to that point and just back to square one. Back to square one, and I mean all the way back to square one, so much so that. I was telling Jason today that I went to, I took a, a seminar, I went to a, a big seminar thing on direct metal printing, direct metal printing, because while I was, while we were doing the, the R&D and the prototyping on the bolts, they were like impossible to build, I mean so difficult, and I, so I thought maybe the direct metal printing was, was would be a way to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, direct metal printing is cool, really cool, but it's just not, not, wouldn't have worked good for our, for what I needed, so that ended up not being feasible, but we ended up getting some decent parts um, to where they would work and fire, and the very first ones were 308. Very first three, very first three was 308. How, how was that game behind that? First rifle laying down behind it, pulling the trigger, and it's kind it was of exciting. I, I thought it was really exciting. Kind of exciting, yeah. It was kind of exciting. Were you, were you nervous that it was going to come apart? No, not really. I mean, I, I knew, I know, you know, I know enough about them to know that the things that'll kill you and the things that won't. We'll just shut that thing up. It's a great, uh, it's a great little ringtone you got there. It's one of my favorite lines out of that movie. Yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> yeah. so, Wasn't well, too nervous. Something really awesome about you guys' bolts is that you use similar style parts to other rifles and existing things so that if something were to go bad and you're up in the middle of the backcountry in Montana and you stop by a small gun store, you're able to fix it and get it up and running again. But, I mean, you, for, the most part. for the most part, yeah. But my main goal was right out of the gate I you know I knew that we had to make it to where you didn't have to modify the lower at all because if you had to modify the lower or anything it was kind of you might as well course. just have to you might as well just buy a new gun I mean it would totally just gut the whole point behind this thing so I wanted to make dang sure we didn't have to do anything to the lowers and the other thing is I wanted to be super simple because keep it simple stupid you know, Absolutely. the the simpler things are, and the less moving parts, the less complicated, the less issues you'll have. And so I, I think one of the reasons that that these uppers are so dang reliable, there's all there's nothing to them. Yeah, but it's running my brain right now. I mean, there's two major moving parts. You got a bolt and a firing pin. There's a bolt, firing pin, an extractor, and ejector. And that's it. You know, there's nothing. That that's it. So, and that was another big thing. And so, the firing pin in the UPR10 right now is a standard DPMS AR10 firing pin. It's the same firing pin. And uh, the extractor is a Savage compatible extractor. Actually, it's compatible with the Ruger Precision extractor too. Okay. I mean, it would that I've tried those in there. They work just fine too. And the ejector is. Remington compatible. So, something I see quite often on my channel uh, whenever I get out there with my UPR10s is someone will approach me and say, well, with the cost of your upper, I can buy a Ruger Precision Rifle instead. 
uh, if someone were to come up to you and say that, what, what would you respond with? I, I know my you answer. Know, I'm well, curious what your guys' answer is. It, I have nothing against a Ruger Precision Rifle. Um, comparing a Ruger Precision Rifle to one of our uppers is like comparing it to a Surgeon or uh, Accuracy International as far as quality goes. You know, we use the very best components. We do them all one at a time. I mean, you're not going to find one that is more consistently built than our rifles are. I mean, that you just won't. You would compare it to buying, uh, compare, so compare our upper, our precision bolt action upper receiver assembly to a, a stiller barreled action or, uh, yeah. you know, a gunworks barreled action or, I mean, those, those receivers are a thousand dollars by themselves mm -hmm. and then there you're screwing on a, a $300 barrel and then you got to have a, a recoil lug a precision ground recoil lug. that's another thirty forty dollars you have to buy a scope base you have to buy a scope base, base and a stock and, and a stock well, I, mean, I mean and a, or a chassis I mean it's not <coughs> the mentality the mentality that people's got when they start looking at AR parts they're they're looking at AR parts, right? Which is cheap. Cheap. You know, you can buy an upper for as cheap as 150 bucks. You know? Oh yeah, I had to explain to a guy today. He's telling me how he could buy this upper in England for 80 dollars, and then just mill a hole in it and use my bolt. I'm like, huh, good luck, buddy. Anyway, anyway, yeah. they got this mentality that this is what it is. But you, you get a an automatic rifle. And a cheap, cheap automatic rifle, most will only shoot inch and a quarter at 100 yards. You won't get premium accuracy from a $150 semi-automatic. I mean, it can happen. You can get a dang good shooting AR. Yeah, I guess that's, got that's true. That's true. I, mean, I do. I got it out of a box that shoots half inch. Yeah, I do. I got one AR. I got lucky. It's extremely rare to find a cheap AR that shoots good. Well, it I is. got four of them. I got four of them. And only one of the four actually shoots inside of an inch. So, <laughs> but but you know, you you can get lucky. But with ours, you don't get lucky because I make every one. I touch every one. You ain't gonna find anyone at Ruger Precision that says, "Yeah, I've touched every single rifle." When I when I sell in my shop, that's that's how I kind of give it to people I say look you're buying a, <clears throat> a custom barreled action that happens to pin to a lower that's the way to look at it and I compare it to Nighthawk custom 1911s everyone knows them and now with the Korth line even even more so with the precision um, Korth is one dude one guy does all those guns and they cost $5,000 for mm -hmm. 1911 there's a reason they use top quality components the, the machining and, and, and craftsmanship the quality control is unparalleled that's what you're getting here. You basically have two dudes that do everything. Everything's that measured. Touch, touch everything's everything. measured. Everything's spec. If it doesn't get <coughs> spec, it's throw it away. Yeah, I've seen and that too. I can I can vouch for that. I've seen. Yeah, why don't you guys touch on uh, <laughs> when something's out of spec and throw it away? Mm. I walked in with a. Well, can I talk about that? I, 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 <laughs> can I talk about that? So we we had uh, at the in the very beginning we had some bolts that that wound up out of spec and it was a number of bolts like fifteen thousand dollars worth of bolts it was a number of bolts <laughs> and it we can't use them because that's not true now, let me let me we could have used them we could have chamber or head spaced them up and used them we could have put them in rifles and they'd work and they'd work fine but what wouldn't have worked is all the rest of the bolts that we had made wouldn't have been able to interchange with those. That's when they wouldn't so interchange with those, we, we had to we had to bounce them out. So we didn't want to have to keep track of X number of bolts in X number of rifles sent out in this big old world of ours, you know. So 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 you guys had a pile of machined bolts ready to go 
Yeah. Machined, was, heat treated, and handled silver solid. You know? And yeah. so you're looking at this. Done bolts. You're looking at this pile of money, potential money right here, and you literally chose quality. Well, it's money. It was expense. I mean, yeah. it's expense to so, get that far. Yes, yeah, so what I see, you literally chose quality over compromise. Right I took there. a hammer, yeah. I smashed every one of those with a hammer and threw them in the scrap pile. So that they couldn't have been so used. they couldn't be used. Right. And welded. Well, I, had, I had two guys, I had one guy welding the bolt heads, and he was smashing some so that they couldn't be used. Like you're saying, in any other mass manufactured rifle, they would have worked. The gun would have fired. Most guys aren't gonna know the difference because they're not. Oh, yeah, you you can't change you can't change bolts in Remingtons. You can't change bolts in Rubens. I don't know of any gun you can change a bolt in. You know, you'll they'll either except for yours, except for ours. So well, we you put you every, can you can with ARs and stuff like that. You can change it, but the yeah, the but head spacing isn't ours is two. It's perfect on every one. You can enter, you can change Every them. Every one of our barrels is head spaced exactly the same. Like they will shoot the same groups. Within two thousandths head spaced at every barrels. And so I can attest to this. When I first did a review for you guys, I had a two forty three barrel on it. We ended up swapping over to a six five Creedmoor to do longer range stuff. And uh, I took a go gauge. You shipped a barrel to my to my house. This barrel had never seen this upper before, never seen this bolt before. And when I put the go gauge in and close it, you could just feel that go gauge touching that shoulder, and it would, the bolt would go down. Put a no go gauge in it, not at all, and it was head spaced as perfectly as you could have been. And you shipped it to me yep. from 150 miles away. Now, I, the, the barrel had never seen that gun before. Yeah, I did them both, and I probably did them both about a year apart, and they were the same. We do everything the same. If it isn't the same, it's thrown away. So. Why don't we get away from your guys' stuff a little bit? I want to really hit the. I want to really drive this home that you guys are shooters. I mean, you guys don't just make this stuff for fun. You, oh, wait, you guys get out and shoot. Make fun of me. This is what I'm <laughs> <laughs> I know this is going. Such a jerk. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> who doesn't like to shoot? It's gonna be so much. Fun. Everybody likes to shoot, man. Yeah. So, Jason, you've got some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, what are some of the more oddball calibers that you've gotten into? Oddball calibers? Man, I'm, I'm a fan of everything. I. I like well, it all. How about some of the bigger calibers you've gotten into? Is that uh, like in the UPR-10, I, I built a 338 Federal in the UPR-10. I, I didn't really know what to expect from that caliber when I first did it. I thought, man, you know, if nothing else, it'll, it'll make a nice hunting rifle, right? But we'll try it and see what happens. You know, I built it and I got uh, the Federal blue box soft point the, crap the only thing you can get the for only it. thing the only thing you can get for that is two different two different types of federals and that's it you don't have a lot of options you have zero zero match grade options for it but i bought those those cheap bullets and well kind of cheap bullets the only bullets i bought them and i took it out and i started shooting and that thing, that thing actually shoots inside a half half minute <laughs> at 100 yards with those soft point bullets I've made, I've hit targets all the way out to 800 yards with that rap, with that rifle. So we were talking with uh, Keith from 5150 for the Couture gun, the Randy Couture gun. Oh yeah, and uh, Liberty, Liberty is yeah. chambered in 338. Yeah, Liberty, Federal. Liberty, the Liberty gun is chambered in 338 Federal. And talking with Keith, they test fired that gun after it was all done, and their shooter was able to use the same crappy ammo he's shooting and hit the gong at a thousand yards. And they hit it consistently. Consistently. So I will definitely have that up on my social media. Check out my Instagram, West Desert Shooter. It's going to be this beautiful engraved bronze rifle with the forefathers on it. And it's going to look like an absolute showpiece, but just know that that showpiece with your guys' bolt action up on it will get out and hit a thousand yards. They did it. Yeah, they did it. They did it. They did it. They just did it. So you've also got a 50 BMG that I know that you like to aim at certain objects and see if you can destroy them yeah, with it. Uh, what's some of the stuff you've tried to destroy with your 50 BMG? Tried, it, it destroys everything. <laughs> everything I've shot so far. I've, I've shot all kinds, of, we've shot fire extinguishers. I shot fire extinguishers in a line. I lined five up once and I shot them. And it starts out as a little half inch hole and it progressively gets larger <laughs> through every Mushrooming every time it hit. Yeah, it goes in a half inch and it leaves the last one at about three or four inch hole. It's pretty cool. We put uh, armor on a dummy. We've shot armor on a dummy with it. Level 3A, AR500 plate. And it uh, 
It doesn't uh, <clears throat> like a six millimeter Creedmoor. It doesn't. It looks just, like a like a laser went through it, but the the fifty looks like you got shot with a golf ball. It just just it just blows that sucker apart. Yeah. What what else have you guys shot that levels your armor with? Because I know you're you. Uh, two <coughs> two forty three. Yeah, we shot a two forty three. We shot a six millimeter. So you're you trying really high speed small bullets versus really big ass medium speed bullets. <laughs> We've shot them. Man, I don't even remember what all we shot them. We did an ultra mag. We shot them with an ultra mag. Which Wind mag. That goes through. Wind mag, ultra mag goes through. 50 goes through. 243. 243 went through. What, 240. what range are you guys shooting this at, roughly? It's off 50 yards. 50 ish, maybe. 50 to 100. That's, far. that's pretty good for 50 yards for a 243 you got here. Oh, it doesn't even slow down. It was the, what was the light, the light horny 70. 75 grain. 75 grain V Max is what those yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. And that was going through level 3. Through like a laser beam. Oh, the yeah. armament round. So that, that's pretty wild. Through the carrier, through the plate, through the dummy, out the back of the carrier, and into the dirt. Same with the 6 millimeter, same thing. Well, we shot a 6.5, and it didn't do crap. We shot it with a 308 with multiple rounds, it didn't do crap. We shot it with, let's see what else we shoot it with. An AK. AK, yeah. With some old, cool, or old school Chinese steel core stuff. Yeah, we seven, shot it with a PSL 54 with, with 50 armor piercing for, for steel core armor piercing. Yeah. That, that it didn't go through, it left a big dent, but it didn't go through. Cracked the backside. It was a little crack. Yeah, I cracked the code, yeah. 5.56, five, five, C23, doesn't, yeah. Nothing. The tannerite. We put tannerite on the front of it. Shot the tannerite. That was that was awesome. That was yeah. actually that was cool. Them dummies are tough dummies. You get the opportunity to buy any of those rubber, rubber dummies. Rubber dummies. Do it. They 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 are durable. So Richard here, uh, he's built himself a six five som in one of his EPR tens. How how did that turn out? How do you like it? Uh, I haven't had much time to play with it yet, but the the ammo we shot out of it shot better than they I shoot, have. They shoot awesome. About like I'm about a quarter of an inch, quarter of a minute, a hundred <laughs> yards. And that that works fine with your guys' bolt and everything. There's no fancy bolts made, so if, it yeah. is a it's a mag bolt face. Okay, so the bolt face. The bolt but, face is but bigger. The bolt the bolt itself is the same. It's just, just a, bolt a mag face. face it's just a bolt face of beer. Everything's the same. So have you guys tested the strength of your actions? We definitely tested the strength of it. We we took we took a two twenty three five five six two twenty three wild one of our wilds, put one together, and the test round in that gun was a hundred and forty seven grain full metal jacket three hundred blackout. That was the first round that gun fired, and it fired it, it spit it out. <laughs> did not destroy the gun. So the, there, there is a video of this you guys put together. There is a video. Yes, and, we and got I've seen video. the footage to where there's a big fireball that goes on, and then you see the projectile hit the dirt. Your guys' 22 caliber rifle swages down the 30 cal full metal jacket into the 22, fires it into the dirt to where you guys were unable to capture it. Too. That that's a lot of pressure required <laughs> to do that. Yeah. And. And wow. so I've seen the pictures of what happened to your guys' bolt action. Now, firstly, on Instagram, I've gone through and seen a few people who accidentally load up a 300 black into their semi-auto ARs, and it looks like a grenade. Oh, yeah, that's inside. catastrophic. You don't really want to do that. Yeah. It'll yeah. blow the bolt carrier group in half. I've seen that. It takes the upper receiver and splays it out like a banana. The whole mm -hmm. barrel extension explodes, and your guys lost an extractor. That's what, yep, we lost an extractor. Uh, I watched you guys take a hammer and hit the bolt to get it open, and then you smash the, you hit the, you hit the bolt action with the hammer, the, the handle on the bolt never broke or bent or did anything, you guys were hammering on that pretty good, and popped it open, and what did you guys find inside? I found the head of the casing, where the side blew out, I found the primer, I found the extractor, the extractor screen. And I'm not, the little ball, the little ball, I lost the little ball. I don't know if I lost it inside the, the gun or anything. I don't know where I lost it to, but I found all the parts that was supposed to be in there still in there when I opened it up. But I think that's a crazy testament. Without images, again, I'll, I'll try and get some of this up on my social media, but without images just on the podcast, it, you guys should Google what happens to an AR-15 when a 300 blackout and a 223 hit. 
it detonates, and these guys actually took it deal. like a champ. It's it's one of the best testaments I've seen you guys ride. Took it like a champ. We pulled on it with a string. <laughs> behind a truck. Yeah, we yeah, were, yeah, right. were like they were not they were not behind the rival. They, <laughs> they had they hooked it up to a string. They all went yeah. and hid behind their ballistic barrier truck and uh, <laughs> yeah, fired it off of the hills. Just in just in case. I mean, we all had our little theories as to what would happen. Nobody figured that it would be a catastrophic failure. We all pretty much figured it was going to take it. We just wasn't sure to what degree the damage was going to be. But I'm going to change the extension nut and then put a new bolt in it, and I'm going to shoot it again. And see if we can see if I can it. capture the lead. Yeah. So we're trying to come up with some type of test similar to that in the UPR10, but the cartridges. Don't, it's really hard to find a cartridge that will chamber in something that's not supposed to. Like the 300 blackout and the 223 is a rare exception. Yeah, it's not supposed to. To it's where it's dangerous. You can you can easily put a 6 millimeter inside of a 30 cal and you fire it. And it's yeah, just, it wouldn't do It's just going to fire four brass and the bullet will tumble out of the barrel. Yeah, we... Yeah, I don't know what we'll do. I don't know what we'll do. We'll probably come up with something cool. In logic. We've got Jason here on the left. He does the coding for the UPRs. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, why don't we? Why don't you tell us what coatings you use and why you use what you use over others? Okay, so I use Duracoat Tac Black. Um, I've been doing that eight nine years now. Um, I originally started with Duracoat because at the time I started doing coatings, they had more options um, color wise. They had two hundred fifty some odd flavors to choose from. Um, and Cerakote at that time only had a, had a few. Um, Cerakote is a great product also. I mean, I can do Cerakote. Um, and they make a fantastic product as well. That's, but I, I start with Duracoat. That's what I'm comfortable with. That's what I use. Um, in our application on the barrels, <clears throat> I, like, I like the Duracoat because it has a little bit of flex. So most people when they're out with their rifles banging around to the, the brush and the trees and stuff, if it smacks into something, it's not going to chip off. Um, and the wear resistance is there as well. So um, I use Durco, that's what I like. Awesome, and so talking about hunting there, uh, are you guys' rifles any good for hunting? Have you guys got any personal experience going out and hunting with your rifle? I hunt with mine. I hunt with that 338 Federal. That's what I took hunting this year. I took hunting. Oh, I didn't have it last year, did I? I took the 308 last year. I took my 308 last year, I took the 338 this year. Were you, were you able to be successful on no. big game? I was unable to get a shot. I had one shot at 800 yards I was going to take, and it was interrupted by people on side-by-sides chasing the same elk that I was. And so what's, what's really cool is you guys are in this small town. Five minutes away, you can be in the mountains off chasing elk in big game, like some of the best in the state of Utah. Um, Richard, you were able to harvest an animal this year with a new cartridge. Why don't you? Uh... I've killed quite a few deer with our UPRs. So okay. I've killed uh, two does with the Valkyrie and and a, and a doe with the Creedmoor. On the Valkyrie, tell us about what ranges you're at and how effective those were. So I let my nephew uh, harvest the doe with the with the Valkyrie, and he he shot her his doe at uh, 250 yards. And he shot her, you know, right behind the front shoulders with the the 90 grain uh, federal ammo, that soft point ammo, and she ran, you know, 50 yards and down she went. Down she so went with a 22 shot. caliber high projector. And this is out of a 16 inch barrel, mind you. Yeah, nice compact system. Yeah, um, you get all your AR ergonomics with it. Oh, I love my little 16 inch Valkyrie, and I I shot a doe with it at, at 300 yards. I shot her in the you know, I shot her in the head, but she didn't go anywhere. No yeah, track on that one. I wouldn't expect you to do that. Yeah. And then my niece, the year before, uh, harvested a doe with, with one of our Creedmoors. And then another friend of ours, Glade, he's killed uh, two mule deer bucks, two mule deer bucks, a white tailed buck, and his grandson's killed two mule deer bucks with a 6.5 Creedmoor. Awesome. PPR fit ten. Two years ago, two years ago, we took a deer at seven hundred yards with six five creep more. One shot, put him down. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And and getting back to it, man. You guys are shooters. You that's why you do what you do. 
really cool. Like yeah, we was we was built we was we was building guns before we started building guns. So getting back to the two twenty four Valkyrie, a lot of people are reporting issues with the Valkyrie. Uh have you guys seen any issues with the Valkyries that you build? And keep in mind, I've got one as well, so if you want to see performance from mine, you can go to my YouTube channel and take a look at what I've got on the UPR 15 playlist. But what about you guys? How are you feeling with your Valkyries? So I like them. Um, the, the biggest thing that we get, that, that, that I hear it all the time, you know, you do a faster twist. You need to have a faster twist. And we do offer a faster. We, I, we yeah, offer two faster. We offer two faster to us. We offer it in six, one and six and a half, and one and six. But you know, the, the one I have is a, again, it's a sixteen-inch barrel, and I'll bet it's get it's upwards of. Honestly, because it is the very first Valkyrie barrel I, uh, that uh, we had, this is my test barrel. <laughs> <laughs> so I messed it up a couple times and cut it down and cut it down. Anyway, it, it's got to have 2,000 rounds through it. And it still shoots, you know, quarter inch groups at 100 yards and loaded with the 90 grain Federal S, you know, the SMKs that they said just box bullets. Mm -hmm. uh, we were at the, the range down in Price here a few weeks ago and I mean, we smacked some little four inch targets at 1,000 yards with it. And, uh, I'll have to I'll have to send you the picture of the it didn't they were uh tannerite bottles. So exploding target bottles, little plastic. Mm -hmm. About four by six. Four by six. Size of a peanut butter can. Yeah, probably. size of a jiff size of a jiffy jiff. Yeah. But uh the They don't go off. They don't go off. Not enough velocity. But I'll send you a picture when you can post it up. But the 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 little hole in it's just this perfect little twenty two caliber hole. I mean it's a perfectly stabilized bullet at a thousand yards, one in seven twist out of a 16 inch barrel. Yeah, and I've had the same results that you guys have. I've actually, I've reloaded, I've stayed away from the 90 grain SMK. Uh, I've heard a lot of people complain about it, so I just haven't gone into experimenting with it personally. I jumped up to the 95 grain SMK. I'm running the one to seven twist. So the 95 should be harder to stabilize. And if one's not going to stabilize, it would be that bullet. And I've shot it out to 300 yards, just sitting on my butt off some shooting sticks. And I shot a three inch group without even trying. Like I wasn't going prone and really taking my time. I was just getting a zero check and it shot him away, no problem. Yeah, we, maybe we gotta try a little further. Maybe we can see something a little further out. I've shot. I haven't shot. If it's, gonna, if it's gonna destabilize, it's gonna do it quick. I haven't, I haven't shot the Valkyrie. You I have to, you've shot all of them. Okay, I've sh I shot all of them, but I, I, I haven't I haven't really sat down and shot any groups. of them for you know, like, shot groups of the You right. uh, you've chosen an interesting cartridge to go out to quite a few hundred yards with uh, your little blackout. What what are the specs on your blackout and how far have you made blackout. it out with that thing? Yeah. What are y'all laughing for? <laughs> yes. I didn't see either of you do it. Tell us about your blackout. Yeah. Your blackout. I got I got and he told me I couldn't. I didn't tell you. No, could. no, Mr. B, Jason. Oh, what? He might. <coughs> this is how things get done. Someone tells you you can't do it. Yeah. Tell I me I can't do yeah, it. Don't what did I say me. you couldn't do that? The day at the range. No, -uh, that's not me. Uh, that wasn't that? me. What day at what range? I believe in you. <laughs> you believe in me. I okay, now we, we know now. you're lying to us. We do now, huh? <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway. The, some, the somebody, day, somebody told him no. It wasn't me. It's probably the <coughs> probably the voices in his head. I'm gonna deal with a red dot. <laughs> no, I did that with the four power. I did 400 yards with the red dot. What, what was your load? What was the max range? It was factory. Yeah. Factory, it was SMB, 147 grain SMB. The same one that we blew the 223 up with. 600 yards, I got out to 600 yards with my 300 blackout. 16 inch, bold action. It's the cool spiral barbed wire fluted barrel. Fancy. That's the one I didn't like. I gave it to him. <laughs> he didn't like it. Yeah. Nobody likes the blackout. Everybody hates it. It's like the 
right at the step tower. Yeah, because Nobody I got likes. a 9 by 39 coming, so. Oh, yeah, that's pretty sweet. No big deal. I got what? a 9 by 39 is coming from Wolf. No you, big deal. You care to elaborate on what a 9 by 39 is? It's the it's a comedy It's round. the father of the 300 blackout. He beats <laughs> it around like a red right step child. It's a 278 grain 9 millimeter on a, on a 762, you know, AK case, basically. It's an AK round with a big fat 9 millimeter stuffed into it. So you're more of an AK guy. You could yeah, say you, that. You could say that. <laughs> yeah, you could say you that. You could say that, yeah. I own more AKs than anything. <laughs> I, more, I own more AKs. He has got, he's got more AKs than he does underwear. That's true. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I don't have to turn them inside out like do my underwear. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, 9x39, just, that's what they use. Uh, it's a Russian round, obviously. They use it suppressed, and they're, it's an integrally suppressed system. Their VSS is the main one. Um, they've got a, uh, like a full automatic sub gun basically that they run it in also. It's extremely quiet. It's just like the blackout. When you suppress a blackout, it's extremely quiet. This is same performance, just a big fat bullet. And I, I like it. I'm super it will be. It will be <clears throat> you here soon in a UPR oh, 15 upper. I'm so excited. The Wolf, Wolf Ammo booth has one of our bold action uppers in there. Yeah. In their booth this mm -hmm. year in 9 by 39 When I heard they wanted to do it, I was like, I need one of those. I never thought, I just never, I just never clicked because <clears throat> nobody was bringing ammo in, so it wasn't really a possibility. And then Wolf was like, yeah, we're bringing the ammo in, and we want one of your UPRs in, in that, that chambering. And Richard told me about it, and I was like, you, we need to get like, give me two. Give me two of those, please. I'm gonna need. <laughs> I'm gonna need that. So, so cruising around shot show all week. Were there a couple booths any of you guys wanted to see in particular? Because literally Man. every every brand I've ever heard of is at shot show, yeah, except yeah. for two. Who, who doesn't want to see everything at shot show? All the cool stuff. You can see what's what's new for the year. What these other people's brilliant ideas were for the year. You know, you get to go see what they brought to the table. SHOT Show is mm -hmm. an amazing opportunity. Uh, you know, I mean, it was our first year with a booth there and everything, and I didn't know what to expect. Lots of sleepless nights before it, not knowing what was going to happen. You know, it's a big gamble and it's an expensive undertaking, but I'll tell you, I've been, I've been very happy with all the opportunities that we've been blessed with at SHOT Show. So hopefully we can capitalize on all, all of them in the coming year. You know, I mean, uh, John Sharp stopped by our booth, wants to work with us. Uh, Brown Ales, David Tubb stopped by and gave us <coughs> advice, you know. Yeah, I made myself look a little bit foolish. Uh, a guy comes walking up to our booth, he's wearing a Geisley Triggers badge and he's got 6'5 guys patch on. And I recognized him and I, at first I thought it was the 6'5 guys and I'm sitting there talking to him and then I, I insinuate that he is one of the six five guys and he tells me he's like no no I'm, I'm not one of the six five guys as so i'm standing there and i read his badge and his name's david and it's not clicking i look down as a david tub and i was like oh i know who you are so he asked me he's like so who am i and so i pull out i pull out a video on my phone and show him one of the tub guns that I snag a video of at range day so yeah. oh this is who you are a little bit embarrassing but uh, it was it was great to meet david tub that was a, that was a really cool experience and that's another thing about shot show people are roaming around it's it's hard it's hard because so many people there are important people in the gun industry you really don't know who you're walking past at any moment i mean that's right we've seen quite a few awesome people like uh one second we're standing there and demolition ranch matt from there just Casually just strolls by, strolls on by. <laughs> just checking out booths. He's walking around. Um, yeah, gather, him up, gather him up, shake his hand. Yeah. yeah, standing there at the. I mean, I knew he was coming, but standing there at the Elf Tackle booth. Here comes Randy Couture strolling down the aisle. You know. Yeah. Like, no big deal. You don't <laughs> see Randy Couture walking around very often. That's for sure. Yeah, he actually came and was involved with uh, that Project Liberty rifle that mm -hmm. you guys are also involved with. So. Yeah. Yep. You guys were able to snag some pictures there. Uh, Thurl Bailey, an old Utah yeah, jazz player, Thurl was Bailey. roaming around. That's definitely one you'd see coming. Yeah, he's like eight yeah, feet tall. Yeah, yeah he's, you see him come from a long ways away. I feel like little kids standing next to him. <laughs> yeah, so his hand, hand my hand head. disappeared. I was like, whoa. His hand that is a big pole. That's a big dude, man. Super nice guy. Way nice guy. Yeah, well, Jerry, good to meet Jerry. Yeah, we stopped oh, by the Smash booth. We were out cruising around. Bumped into Jerry Mikulik. Jerry Mikulik, yeah, man. Mm -hmm. 
one of the fastest men on the planet with a gun. Uh, that dude's amazing. Yeah, so I didn't want to take up too Hopefully much of some time. of that talent rubs off on me. Yeah, we'll have to go grab some revolvers and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay, Wish. I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> um, did you guys see anything interesting at Range Day itself? Did we see any of our neighbors up to anything cool? Hear any? Hear anything off in the distance? Uh, yeah. We heard some, you know, some mini guns going. Mini guns, and if you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> Wait, you're in Norma mini gun. Hell, that things are just oh, awesome, man. man. That's freaking sweet. Mini guns were really cool. The, the hyper fires were pretty cool. Fire lights were pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, the Sierra guys next door kicked us some ammo. That was nice. Yeah. Yeah, so all day uh, Sierra was introducing their new game changer line. So they had their uh, their chief ballistician out there with his F class rifle as well as a uh, AR 10 308 hanging out in the wind and the cold. Had a little bit of a slow moment. Those guys were cold and hungry, so. Traded a sandwich for yep. some ammo. We gave them a, I gave away a sandwich that wasn't mine, and then I got waved over to their booth, and uh, they. They very graciously gave me a box of the new Game Changers in 308. A box, a case. Gave yeah. a case. case. They gave me a case of 308 for a, a little sandwich in the cold, but the, the only well, downside of this some, story... Yeah, you got some data. It was it was ammo for a sandwich and some data. They, yes. want, they want us oh, to we'll, test, we'll it. test it. We'll test it. It's a brand new bullet, it. as far as I know, that no one's... It is brand new to the market. And yeah. we, talked to, we talked to them today, and uh, we're going to get some more, and we're going to do... Some more some, testing. Some testing with their ammo and see mm -hmm. see how well their ammo performs, you know, with ballistically and velocity. And we also talked to Hornady today and we're gonna, oh, yeah, we're gonna do some testing with the Hornady stuff too and they're gonna take some of our some of our uppers and do some testing of their own with our uppers, so that's pretty exciting. Yeah, absolutely. That's and the thing about shots, it's just amazing opportunity. Yeah, amazing exactly. Opportunity. If there's any company you wanna work with, you can go up there and you can walk right up to them and not just it's not like walking up to you know the guy that works at Horner. Do you like you said to I me? Mean, you were standing there talking to some dude at the Manners booth, and it. I'm, yeah, I'm talking to him about an ELR rifle. It's and it's got a three-inch profile barrel, and I. It's a giant rig. You know exactly that it's an ELR rig. I see a guy sitting in the corner. Start asking him some questions about it, and uh, I'm asking him what velocities he's running, what it's chambered in. It's 416 Barrett. Uh, talking about the stocks and whatnot, and so I. I asked him for his card, he didn't have one, so I pulled out my Reloaders Network card and he writes his cell phone number on there and writes down Tom Manners and he's the owner of Banner Stocks. <laughs> and so yeah. I look at him, I'm like, yeah, I don't think it's any coincidence that your name's Manners and we're in the Manners booth. He's like, oh no. So, And he, he told me that uh, he's not much of an office guy, he likes to be out in the shop and might be a little bit hard to get all of them. So. But that was, that was really cool. Yeah, so I mean, you, you get to talk to the people in charge, you know, the, the guys that, that make the, the big changes and the, the, the real innovation. So it's pretty neat. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. So, all right, guys, do we have any closing thoughts? Any last things you want to talk about? Thanks for having us. Oh, I really appreciate you guys being a part of the Muzzle Blast podcast. This is only episode two, and I really look forward to keep going. Obviously, did you guys get more new cool stuff that uh, I know you guys have in the works. Uh, we'll have you on again and we'll get out to the range. We're gonna go make some videos and have a lot of fun. Maybe try and blow up another 223 with a blackout. <laughs> yeah, He's not gonna again. give up till he finds a bullet. So I'm I'll sure. Try, yeah, we'll do it again. We'll, we'll do it again. We'll do it until he finds a bullet. Awesome, thanks so much. Wait, 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 wait. All right. When is the Logan Logic? Yeah. Subsection going to start. <laughs> Why are we starting the load, when are we like start logic, logic portion of this? So, yeah, these guys. Uh, For those that there's don't no know, short, there's no shortages of smartasses on this trip. And, uh, <laughs> there's plenty of shit talking to go around. So, what are you talking about? However, Logan lays it down with his very straightforward, basic, get to the point logic, and it's hilarious. It is. And quite so funny. we have we have suggested he should have. Hey, a, a little part of the show, this logic, podcast, just the side thing. You guys are saying it all wrong. You gotta like, whisper. And then we got like, oh, Trent says whisper. he says you gotta say Logan Logic. You gotta whisper <laughs> Logan Logic. So when anybody asks something stupid, and Logan gives them his re his retort, and we all <laughs> we all whisper Logan Logic, which we think is gonna be awesome for the podcast. Great. We we try to get him to change the name of his podcast to Logan yeah. Logic. 
But he's pretty set on Muzzle Blast, so... Yeah, but, I mean, we know ours is going to be successful. So, I mean, yeah, Logan Logic is definitely the most popular part of your future podcast, I'm sure. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. <laughs> well, uh, right now it's going to stay the Muzzle Blast podcast. <laughs> so hearing protection required. So, protection. thanks so much, guys, for listening. Um, we're going to film the outro at this point, so... Sweet. Actually, we'll throw this in real quick, so... So we have Jason Baker with you into precision. We have Richard Hamilton with Rich, with you into precision, and we have Jason Woods with you into precision. Thanks so much for, for being on here, guys. I really appreciate it. No problem. Yeah, thanks for having us. And thank you for having me at Shot Show as well. I've, it's been a real honor to come down and hang out with you guys. Thanks for coming, man. Booth, so. Yeah, it's been fun. It's been a fun week with you, man. Yeah, absolutely. Good times. Well, all right, guys, that was the interview with the Uinta Precision Group after SHOT Show 2019. We've got one more day left as of right now, and then we're heading home. So it was a great trip. I, like I mentioned at the end, I, I'm completely honored that I was able to join this group and uh, help represent Uinta Precision along their journey. So it was awesome talking with Jason, Jason, and Richard. Uh, I really appreciate having those guys on as well. Like, they have a they shared a wealth of knowledge with us, and I hope that you guys learned quite a bit about where their company came from and a little more about who's behind you went to Precision. So thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I look forward to episode three, and we will talk to you guys later.